Good morning. How are okay. you doing? Pretty good. good. So, good. Uh, so am I like up on a screen or what's happening? You are. You're on, you're on our TV here. Very good. Um, I think he can hear you. We can, uh, we can, uh, right now we mainly see your, your computer screen. We got a little video of you up in the top corner. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the intention. Great. So right now we have uh, uh, my cybersecurity and tech support class, the 11 0 court that uh, is joining in. I think I have it so everybody's kind of been moved over to the side of the room that you can kind of see 95% of us. Very good. <laughs> so uh, I'll bring it over to you two. All right. <laughs> For, I'll, I'll just I'll just do introduction really quick there. Um, and uh, just say some hellos. So my name is uh, Adam Benet, and I am the uh, Center of Excellence Lead for Digital Innovation. I'm actually a teacher from Harrison Trimble. Don't make fun of me too much there, students at Salisbury. Um, I've known Mr. Spencer for quite a number of years, and we've got to work and collaborate over time, and I usually just bug him. I feel bad. I'm always putting stuff on his plate, but um, this was a great opportunity to connect. So the Centers of Excellence um, for Digital Innovation, the goal of everything that we're doing is to try and provide students with like hands-on, authentic learning, right? And do things like this more often, speaker series. Um, we're so, so lucky to be joined by somebody that's like a cybersecurity professional that has been working in the industry, in the IT industry for, you know, well, go, go, well not quite two decades, but, you know, getting on to there um, here in New Brunswick. So all you students sitting there, it's it's super exciting to see you all. I'm glad that you're there. Uh, you're lucky to have a teacher like Mr. Spencer that can show you some of these things um, because this opportunity doesn't exist at every high school either. Um, and so we want students to realize, you know, it's important to have technical skills just as a human. <laughs> uh, but if any of you are sitting there and thinking about what your life will look like after you, uh, high school, right? This is the time to start thinking about it, right? You're in grade 10, 11, 12, a college, university. Um, and we really want to highlight cybersecurity because this is a growing field. There are tons of jobs available out there here in New Brunswick and across the world. Uh, there's literally tens of thousands of unfilled jobs across the world in this in this profession right now. So basically every company, government, they need people. Um, and so people sitting in this classroom like yourselves could be one of those people. So um, I don't want to drone on too long. Uh, I'm not the main star of the show. Myron here is. So um, Myron, uh, so uh, just a little bit of background. I've reached out to um, uh, some different cybersecurity folks in the province to say, hey, would you be interested in talking to some classes? And Myron's like, yes, I can do that. So I really, really do appreciate um, you taking the time to do this. And Mr. Spencer, too, for corralling and working and going through emails to set all this up. And of course, the students sitting there, we really thank you. Um, and hopefully I'll get to come in in person sometime and, and do some more stuff with you all. Um, so I will stop uh, talking. I'll let Byron kind of jump on and take over. I know I got a bit of a PowerPoint going and uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, as I told Adam before I, uh, uh, before this all started, uh, one of the reasons I want to be here is uh, I find that we the teams that I've worked on are kind of smaller than they really need to be, and so we need people uh, in cybersecurity to uh, just do the work that needs doing to keep us all safe. So um, that's kind of why I said I'd take time out of. I'm currently at work. This is in a work meeting room. Uh, take time out of work to come talk to you today. Um, so I guess thank you for having me here today. I should say a few things to kind of introduce myself and beyond just having been there, been in the industry for 20 years. Um, I've been working in what we used to call information security. It's actually 16 years now. Uh, I feel in some ways I looked into a really good career, which is, uh, as I said, a good opportunity for all of you two. I say uh, luck played a big role because when I started, I didn't know it was going to turn out to be as big as it is. Uh, I, I was just a, a new application developer, a new programmer on contract with the government that I was hoping I'd get renewed each year, writing applications for the New Brunswick Department of Justice. And uh, that government back in 2006 came out with a new rule, a new policy for information security that said uh, that every department had to have someone designated to handle that responsibility. And I, as someone who was just desperate to keep getting renewed anything someone asked me to do i said yeah i'll do it but at the time uh i didn't really know and no one did 
uh, what cybersecurity was going to be and what we should be doing. I remember meeting in a room with 20 other people in 20 other departments, most of them more senior to me. And we were reading through this policy, just trying to figure out what it was that we were supposed to do. Um, so at now, today, there are lots of standards and best practices and good ways of doing cybersecurity, but we kind of had to figure that out. Uh, over the years, I established the cybersecurity uh, program at the Department of Justice and Office of the Attorney General, which meant securing records in our court system and legal opinions from our from government lawyers and the system that manages family support payments. Um, then after working for about 10 years in the Department of Justice, I moved into the Department of Public Safety and did the same thing uh, to their information security program, uh, handling police and prison data and some security for the emergency measures organization that responds in cases of uh, like floods or ice storms or t potentially terrorist attacks. Uh, then I moved in 2017 into Service New Brunswick, which is the province's largest employer of IT professionals. We've got about a thousand uh, people working in computer related jobs in Service New Brunswick, and I was on the information security team for that group, and we provide IT support to all of government. And then in 2021, I was recruited over to New Brunswick Power. So at the moment, I'm doing the cybersecurity that helps you keep the lights on. Um, let me see if I can move to the next slide here and the next one. So what am I going to cover? I think that uh, some of the reason Mr. Spencer gave me some of his time, some of his class time to speak to you is that uh, he hopes I can tell you about working, what working in cybersecurity is actually like. Some things change pretty quickly, so if it's not your day job, as it's not for him, it can be hard to keep up with the newest opportunities that, that are available. And I'll tell you, there really are some good opportunities to get the skills you need to do to do the type of work that I do without it costing you very much, uh, except for the amount of time that it would take to learn, which to me seems like people can skill up in maybe two or three years. Um, I'll also tell you about, from my experience, what it's like to work in this field with uh, one small example of what a security assessment is like based on your high school's website. I just did a quick uh, assessment with some of the tools that I have of your school's website. Um, I hope in this to give you both the good parts and the parts that I like least about this job so that you can get a realistic sense of what it's like. Um, I'll cover the different areas of cybersecurity, because it's not just one thing. There are lots of different specializations you can do. And I'll tell you a little bit of what it was like to me to get to the position I've gotten to, and then provide you with some resources that you could learn, uh, some resources that you could use to learn, and some ideas of how you could get started if this is a career path you wanted to follow. Um, and I'm going to try and leave some time at the end for questions. Um, but of course, you can ask me a question at any point if you want to. And Mr. Spencer, if you see someone raising their hands, uh, please draw their draw my attention to that because um, I'm not a expert speaker, and so I am kind of reading off a script and trying to focus on multiple things at once. So I may not see someone raising their hand, and I really would like to uh, respond to anyone's questions if they have them. And uh, so, with that said. I guess, does anyone have any questions when you think about cybersecurity that you really would like me to answer today? Because I'll try and build that into what I have to say. Anyone? Okay. Oh, I guess take it away. Okay. Um, I'm slipping off. Sorry. I have. A, yeah. I just have another meeting to hop to. I thank you, Mr. Spencer and Myron. Thank you so much for all this and students for tuning in. Um, I and Steve, um, Mr. Spencer will be in touch anyway. Okay. That was great. See you uh, later, Adam. Okay. See you guys. All right. Okay. Uh, so, the thing to know about a career in cybersecurity is that it can vol involve a lot of different roles and different things you could focus on. As I said, it isn't just one thing. In, pa in fact, uh, one popular information technology IT security certification, the Certified Information Systems Security Professional. 
uh, has eight domains of knowledge you have to master from the physical security of buildings through to software security, cryptography, how to work with executives and do security governance. So kind of think of it like in the same way we call a medical professional a doctor, whether they're your family doctor or a surgeon who specializes in brain surgery or ears, noses and throats or your digestive system or all kinds of things different doctors can specialize in, we still call them a doctor. Similarly, in cybersecurity, you can be a cybersecurity specialist and still specialize in a bunch of different things, do things that strike your interest. And what your day-to-day -day job looks like would be very different depending on which one you pick. Um, so for a lot of people who start off doing something like tech support or something else and move into cybersecurity, their first role is something like a cybersecurity operations center specialist. You might have seen uh, whenever someone says cybersecurity or you see it in the news, you'll see like a picture of a guy with four monitor, a guy or girl with four monitors up in front of them uh, with a bunch of alerts, uh, maybe a diagram of a network with a red flashing light. Um, these are your SOC analysts who are first line of defense when something goes wrong. In a large business with good cybersecurity, each computer has antivirus on it, and there are firewalls that protect the internet, uh, the organization from internet-based attacks, and sometimes other sensors and alarms, and all of that feeds into what's known as a CM, or Security Event Information Manager. It's a big database of all the sensor data that's coming in from all the computers in an organization. So when a computer gets a virus or a hacker tries to get into the network, that that detection goes to the security operations center. Uh, this can be hard to be that analyst because automated systems aren't always great at put, putting what's most important at the top of the list of alerts, and lots of the times you'll get fal false alarms. But a skilled SOC analyst can sift through all that information and know when to raise an alarm elsewhere in the organization. Uh, they are the key to stopping hackers quickly and stopping viruses and ransomware from spreading throughout your organization. One of the downsides of this particular focus within cybersecurity is they need to be on watch 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because your attack could come from anywhere in the world and uh, at any time. Uh, actually, uh, statistically, it's most likely that they happen on like a Saturday morning because that's when people are mo like a Saturday, say two in the morning, because that's when most people in North America are asleep. So that's when the attackers tend to strike. Um, so given that you've got to be on watch 24 hours a day, seven days a week, often these jobs are shift work. Um, so another possible role when you think of cybersecurity, the information, uh, the image you have in your mind may be a hacker getting into someone's system. In the industry, we call these people penetration testers or the red team as, con as contrasted with the blue team who are the people who are defending. So the cool thing about being a red teamer is you get to actually compromise systems. I'm not going to do that here today because if you're going to attack a system, you need to get permission upfront or else it's a crime. And as an ethical hacker, uh, one of the certifications I have is CEH, Certified Ethical Hacker. You have to set carefully, careful boundaries around what you do. But I have gotten permission from your school to do a basic scan, which I did last night. It took a couple hours. Um, the reason they gave me that permission is because the people maintaining your school's website know that people are always running scans like this from all over the internet, which is part of why it's important you keep your own sec computer secure because someone from anywhere in the world could scan it for problems at any time. Um, with that said, if someone asked me to assess the security of a website after I define the scope of what I'm allowed to do, the first thing I'd do is test its HTTPS or HTTP security. And HTTP is the, the protocol that you that is used to transfer data for web pages. Um, when I did that on a website called SSL test, which I'm going to try and bring up here, and I don't know why my mouse has gone away. OK, um, when I did that, uh, let's see, can I get it? Can you see? Uh, Qualys SSL lab screen there. Yeah. yeah OK. Yeah. So when I did that with uh, SSL test, um, this is the main server that runs your website. Uh, it actually runs a lot of different schools websites. Um, and we came back with 
a lot of good things. Uh, often I'll see yellow or red in these big summary here. Uh, it says that it supports TLS 1.3, which is the highest level of uh, encryption protocol that we currently have. Um, this particular report took about 15 minutes for it to do, and it um, showed up a little progress bar as it was going. Um, and you'll see, um, as you get into cybersecurity, you'll end up with what each of these things um, what a common name is, what OCSP is, uh, what certificate revocation is, all that stuff is stuff you would learn as you get to be a cybersecurity professional. And it quickly tells you in yellow what things you need to look for. And there aren't all that many here. Um, it does say that there are some weak ciphers supported, but it's not a huge deal. Um, they're all, they're not, completely broken, they're just a little bit weak. And then you'll see also what this website does is it simulates what it would be like to browse your school's website from all kinds of different devices. So Android is um, your, if it's not an Apple smartphone, it's an Android phone typically. Um, and it goes back to Android 4, which is years and years old. And the reason they do that is one kind of attack that a hacker can do is called a downgrade attack, where um, they, if this website supported an old version of TLS, um, which it might do because maybe an old device can't support the newer stuff, then there are gonna be known weaknesses in that. So if an attacker pretends to be from an old device, then they can get around all the security improvements that have passed it that have happened in the past few years. So luckily, we don't see that they support um, that that downgrade attacks would happen in this case. So um, we didn't see very much in this, or I didn't see very much in this report that concerned me. But um, as I'm sure Mr. Spencer explains to you, if you get stuck in a technical support situation, you try and find another way around the problem. Problem solving is a big uh, thing. And so if you similarly, if you get stuck and and one tool doesn't give you very much to go on, if you're attempting to penetrate a system, you move to a different tool. So the next thing I would do is I'd go to the top of this report and I get the IP address, which is what identifies this server on the internet. And I would run a scan to see what else is running on that server. Now, I would use a tool for that um, called Nmap. And I did that as well. And the Nmap output, again, it's mostly automated, but you set your options uh, and you run it. And this took I think again, about 20 minutes. And what it did was it showed me everything. It ran through um, every way that it could to try and connect to that server to see whatever else was running. And what I see here is, yes, HTTPS is running, which is what, oh, I'm sorry. I, I realize now that the, I've got this on the wrong screen. Uh, there we go. I realize now that, um, so uh, let me go back and show the Nmap output. So it ran a scan, um, got back a website, uh, looked for um, how to get from where I am to where that website is and scan to see what other things besides HTTPS are running. And probably you'll learn, if you haven't already, you'll probably learn about um, ports and networking uh, and it's doing it on different ports. So HTTPS is port 443 and HTTP, which is your unsecured version, does seem to be running on this server. And I found that interesting and said, okay, I wanna find out, uh, can I just go and take the uh, website's address, and instead of having it be HTTPS, can I make it HTTP and will it work? And about 50% of the time, it does. Uh, it didn't in this case, it gave me an access denied, so that was good, but I still wanted to see, and there's not too much else running on this server that I could try and attack, but I wanted to see 
uh, if I crawled through every link on this website and had an automated tool that tried ver to detect whether various attacks could be done, what would it find? And that tool uh, has a funny name. It's called Burp. Um, and I will put that up for you here. Uh, this scan took a couple hours. It was running till three in the morning, pretty much. Um, and it ran through and scanned every single thing. And we can sort by severity. Uh, so there's two things it tells you. It tells you how severe is this problem and um, how sure is it that the problem exists. So sometimes it's like, uh, this appears to be this server version, but we're not sure. Or it appears like you could put in some input and get out some bad output, but we're not sure of that. And so as a security professional trying to assess this website, what I would do uh, over the period of several days is I would order and I would say, what are the highest, and right now we've got one high finding and a bunch of lows, so this is really quite good. Um, but I would go and I'd start from the highest and I'd do an analysis and say, can I replicate this? Because again, automated tools, often they have false positives. So can I do manually what it says can be done? And can I turn that into an example that makes an impact for people and they understand uh, why a hacker would want to do that and why it's bad? So that's the basics. Unfortunately, given that this class is short, I can't go through uh, too much more of a security assessment, but that just gives you an idea. And the fun thing is, all of these tools, um, Burp Suite Professional, you can get a 30-day trial and they have a community edition. Nmap is free. SSL test is free. A lot of security tools are free and you can learn to use them without just basically Google them and download them. Um, <clears throat> so, um, let me bring back my presentation. So that is the day-to-day -day life of a penetration tester. The easy thing there is the good. there are good tools, often free. The fun thing is you're often able to materially improve someone's security without too much effort. Like I found all this stuff in an evening of work. Um, the harder thing is though, is that you have to constantly keep learning and keeping up on new techniques. Because I, in order to make the case that we need to fix a problem, I really have to understand all the tests that this automated tool is doing. And there's a lot of, inf like when you click on each of those vulnerabilities, it explains it in a great deal of detail. Um, and that it changes, I think they update every two months with new attacks. So I gotta keep up on that. Um, I also have to keep up on changes in how software is designed and written because it's changed hugely over the time that I've uh, been in this field. Uh, I've got to keep up on new vulnerabilities that are discovered in software, and I got to know what is in my organization so that I can know what applies to us. Uh, so if, like me, penetration testing is something you do when asked, but it isn't your full-time job, you'll find that for the most part, every time you're asked to test a system, it'll be different from anything you've done in the past, which is good in one sense. It's always something new, but it's kind of scary because I have to learn and get correct an understanding of this system. Um, and it isn't that I just need to find one hole. I have to do the best I can to find all the ways in. Because as a penetration tester, it's not my job just to prove that I can get in once. As much as I can, I, I have to do everything I can to find everything. Because if I find one way in, but I miss another, and an attacker finds that one, well, my finding that one way didn't really help a lot. And for me, probably the most frustrating part of this particular specialty within cybersecurity is you can sometimes find a hole that a hacker can get in. You try to explain it to someone, because as you can see, some of this was pretty technical. 
uh, and they end up not understanding the risk and not fixing it very quickly or fixing it at all. And you go around knowing there's a problem that people could fix, but they chose not to, and maybe it's your fault because you didn't explain it good enough. And honestly, I've seen a lot of cybersecurity professionals who wanted to work in large organizations so they could have a big positive impact, but then the bureaucracy and the difficulty of explaining these technical things to people and how long it can take sometimes to fix things became frustrating for them. Um, I think one of the least well-appreciated aspects of being a penetration tester is you have to be able to explain what you did in a way that someone who doesn't know nearly as much about computers as you do will understand it and why that's bad. I find that a lot of penetration testers, uh, they get so much knowledge and they're very proud of having as much knowledge that they have that they start to lose respect and understanding for people who don't know as much as they do about computers without realizing that translating what they know into non-hacker English is a really core part of their job. Mr. Spencer put in his course outline uh, that you develop, he, and I'm quoting here, the ability to explain technical concepts in non-technical language. And that's spot on whether you're in tech support, tech support or cybersecurity or anything else to do with computers. Remembering that something, understanding something yourself isn't enough, you have to be able to explain it to people is to me, maybe the most important thing you can learn. So there are, beyond Security Operations Center analyst and penetration tester, there are other roles that I want to just quickly go over. Um, so part of that skill and explanation that I talked about is trained into you when you turn a penetration test into a risk assessment. So let me give you an example. In 2018, a high, school a high school student hacked the government of Nova Scotia's Freedom of Information portal, but calling it hacking might oversell it a little bit. What he did was he saw that when he logged onto the site to get a document, the web address had ID equals some number, and he thought to himself, now, what if I change that number? And just by changing that number to that number plus one, he was able to see other people's documents without any authentication. Now, someone who made, wanted to make this sound impressive could say that they executed an auth authentication bypass or an insecure direct object reference, but a good risk assessor who understands that their job is to explain things in regular language would say something like that, would ask questions like, what's the sensitivity of the data here? If this data is highly sensitive, then you have a problem because an attacker doesn't need any tools or to be very skillful to compromise your website. So even if this particular teenager didn't do it, the likelihood that some would do, someone would do is pretty high. And a high likelihood combined with high impact means high risk. That's risk analysis. So this there is one of the first things you should fix. Whereas if the answer came back different, that risk assessor could say, if the website contains only public, public information or is an internal site behind a firewall so it's harder to get to, the risk is lower. So the job of a risk assessor is to understand the different threats that a website or other computer system could face and use some standardized way to explain that risk so that if there are many servers and even more apps, and so for example in New Brun and, and NV Power there are 3,500 servers and maybe twice as many applications that we have to manage, and let's say most of them have some problems, although may, maybe they're just low severity, the most important problems need to get fixed first. And that's what risk assessment is about, figuring out what are those most important problems and making sure they stay in front of the right people. Um, a good penetration tester will also be good at expressing risk, but creating a risk assessment and executing a penetration test are two very different skill sets and lots of times, Penetration testers aren't great at risk assessment and explaining, which leads to some of the fr frustration I mentioned before. Uh, related to penetration tests and risk assessments is vulnerability assessment and management. Like I said earlier, uh, although I don't think I did, uh, I meant to say that uh, one of the responsibilities I have at NB Power uh, is I'm responsible for their vulnerability management program which means I run a scanner which sweeps our network and tells me things like whether a server has old software on it which should be updated because someone found a security hole in that software. Finding vulnerabilities is one phase of a penetration test, but it's only a part. And then 
once that vulnerability has been found, you've got to have someone responsible for fixing it. For most individuals, for like you uh, as an individual student, um, vulnerability management on your computer is installing Windows Update on the second, uh, updates on the second Tuesday of every month, which, by the way, you definitely should always do. It's one of the most important things you can do to protect yourself from getting hacked. But the problem is, if you're an organization with 3,500 employees, a few thousand servers, and a few thousand laptops, you can't just easily install the updates as soon as they come out. For one thing, if you tried to download several thousand copies of the updates from Microsoft at once, you'd flood your network. For another, there's a pretty good chance that somewhere in their, your organization, there's a software program or a piece of hardware that doesn't work well with one of the updates. And maybe that uh, takes out, gets rid of some computer that a lot of people depend on. And if your organization, like NB Power, is responsible for keeping the lights on, you really don't want to mess up an important computer, even if not updating it might leave it vulnerable. So vulner vulnerability management, when done right by a professional, involves reading up on the vulnerabilities that have been fixed, figuring out how serious they are, and having a testing process where you send the updates out to a few computers and see if anything goes wrong, then a few more, and meanwhile you watch the news and see if other people are having problems in other organizations, and then eventually, hopefully within 30 days, you roll the update, update out to everyone you can, and anyone you can't because of some technical glitch, you come up with a plan to reduce that risk, maybe you put it behind some protective measure, uh, and you execute that plan and track that you've made an exception to your normal patch management process. So, well, Byron, Byron, yep, that sorry. What would have happened with the 911 issue there in Nova Scotia? Uh, I often, I'm not sure which uh, of that one, honestly, um, but often, yes. Uh, yeah. I think, I think last week there was a like a Microsoft 365 outage that turned out to be someone rolled out an update that broke something and they had to roll it back. And it basically affected all Microsoft co customers worldwide. It was a bad day for that guy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another important aspect of cybersecurity is security education. Like I said, sometimes having the technical skills to hack and having the communication skills to explain things clearly to a wide variety of audiences, well, they're just really different skills. Um, personally, I've got a master's degree in adult education, and my first IT job was designing online IT courses. And doing that well takes a lot of work because you have to really think about how someone is going to receive this. Um, no matter how good your penetration testing and vulnerability management team and security operation center are, if the people in your organization are always clicking on every link someone sends them in an email without thinking, you're going to have problems all over your network. This is why when I'm evaluating an organization that we at NB Power might buy some software from or work with, one of the first things I ask for to see how mature their security program is is to see proof that they've got a good education program for their employees, which explains how to recognize the many different types of scams they might see in their email, their social media, on their phones, while browsing the internet. And hopefully it encourages to them to do things like use a password manager and two-factor authentication. So although if you end up becoming a cybersecurity professional for your career, these things will start to seem really basic, they're important. In cybersecurity, we call them security hygiene, because the same way as doing simple things like washing your hands can protect you from physical viruses in the physical world, knowing to do a few th simple things like not reuse your passwords and keep your software updated and have back backups of your important information will make a big difference to how many times you get hacked and how much of a problem it is when it does happen. <clears throat> um, and then uh, another key role is incident response, and I'm responsible for the... Uh, incident management program at NB Power as well. As you see, with a small security team, you can sometimes, although you could ideally have a single focus, with the labor shortages that we have, often a cybersecurity professional wears many hats. Um, and one of those for me is incident response. Because as good as your team is, and no matter how well educated the people your in your organization are, problems will still happen sometimes and you need to be able to respond the right way and quickly when they do. 
This means you've got to have at least some people trained in what to do to contain the damage if something bad happens, and how to collect and preserve evidence so you can know what happened. This gets extra tricky if you try to get a hacker prosecuted for stealing your stuff, which, yes, it's a crime to hack without permission, um, but getting people actually punished for that can be hard because the way you're, you've collected the evidence has to hold up in court. There are whole certifications in how to do a forensic investigation of a computer and figure out what happened while still preserving the evidence so you can prove it to a jury. And finally, some of the most famous stuff, security research. You can make a good living just by finding bugs and reporting them to companies that made the buggy, buggy product, many of whom will pay a bug bounty with more get, money getting paid if you find a more serious bug. And even if you don't make your money off bug bounties, uh, getting famous for finding a really serious bug in a widely used piece of software can really boost your career, and getting good at security research makes it very likely that someone will hire you on a full-time basis to find all their problems before some outside person does. Plus, um, if you like cybersecurity because you really like understanding how computers work and making them do stuff they're not supposed to, that's what security research is. Um, so I see that we're, I think, getting close to the end of class, so I'm going to have to go quickly here. Um, I'll say that one of the things that I really like is that everything's new and scary, but one of the things, that the, the downside of that is that often you get thrown into a situation where you're asked to make decisions and do analysis of stuff that you're not so familiar with, and that analysis can have a really serious impact. Um, uh, an example, yeah? Am I right? We still have 25 minutes. Oh, you do? Oh, yeah. I thought it was 11.15. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, well, then I'll continue reading as I start it. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, so, um, given how many different things there are to do within the fields of cybersecurity, and also because of the fact that the internet has only been something that people were on for a few decades, and cybersecurity has only been around for a relatively short time, about 15 years had governments gotten really serious about it, um, there are lots of ways that you can come to have a good career in cybersecurity. Uh, if you want to be a doctor, the path is clear. Go to medical school, then a kind of a apprenticeship they call residency. Then after enough years of practice, you're certified. If you want to be an engineer, again, you take a specific degree, spend some time after that as an apprentice and a journeyman, then you get your professional PNG designation. And while cybersecurity is in some ways like that, there are some certifications you can do, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, how to get to the point where you call yourself a cybersecurity professional and get taken seriously is less well-defined for us than it is for doctors or engineers. Uh, how it worked for me was, like I said, I was a programmer writing computer applications, and then someone basically said, anyone want to do cybersecurity for us? And I raised my hand and then had to figure it out as I went. I had to develop a cybersecurity from, program from scratch without knowing what it should be like or what it should involve, which is, as I said, just a minute ago, really hard and scary at times. Because I, the kind of mind that I have, I like things to be well-defined and logical and for there to be a clear answer. And that at the time, there often just weren't clear answers to how cybersecurity, which at the time, again, was called information security, should be done. That's changed to some degree. There are some standard ways of doing many cybersecurity-related things. But there's still a lot of ambiguity, and a lot of times when someone asks me what to do, I still have to be give the best answer that I know, <clears throat> more like giving my opinion than telling people the established fact of what they should be doing based on hundreds of years of practice. Um, I'm more of a generalist than someone who specialized in one area, and that means I get a mix of products, uh, projects, sorry. and since I really love learning new things, the fact that I'm always faced with something new and it never gets stale is one of the favorite parts of the job. Um, related to that, my team leader has said that I can have one day of a week for learning and skill development, and I've negotiated one hour a day for keeping up with security news and threats, because one of the more important things a good security professional ha has to be able to do is, when some new problem comes to the attention of my boss's boss's boss, I have to be able to know what it is, whether it applies to us, and what we should do about it, um, 
and often when a new vulnerability comes out, hackers are already using it to break into people's systems, so we have to respond really quickly. And even though I do listen to some security podcasts weekly, that isn't quite quick enough, which is why I'm given that hour a day. So I'd say, given how fast cybersecurity changes, if you do want to make a career out of this, one of the upsides is you'll always be learning, but one of the downsides is you'll likely have to spend some evenings and weekends keeping up because some new thing has happened and you need to understand it, or some new technology has been developed and you need to learn what it means from a security perspective, or maybe some new hacking tool came out, which they do every frickin' day, um, and you need to learn how to use it because attackers might use it too and you want to know what they might do to you. It's hard to sum up the work that I do. I'd say my very favorite thing is I really like understanding things that are hard to understand and most people don't get, and then translating what I know into something that more people can understand and so then they know why it matters to them. And that's a really poor part of a cybersecurity career, even if you're doing something very technical like red teaming or exploit development. <clears throat> I'd say the thing that I like the least is because there aren't enough people with cybersecurity skills, there's always too much to do. And because almost every project or assessment you do has some new element to it, you're constantly being asked to give an opinion on things that you're trying to hard to understand, but you may not yet understand completely. Sometimes the level you've, of responsibility you're asked to take on without too much guidance or very well, uh, very well established answers to the questions you're trying to answer, it can be stressful. And if you get it wrong, particularly as you advance and take on more senior positions, that can be a big deal. Like, for example, one time a few years ago, I was asked to do a security assessment on the system that generates driver's license for us here in New Brunswick. And it was using a programming language that I had no experience with. Eventually, because this thing was too important to risk screwing up, I convinced the people I was working for at the time to pay the equivalent of six months of my salary to hire in a couple of experts in that language. But even though I'd done that, <laughs> even though I'd done that, I still had to say what should be in the contract for what they should do. And I'm not a lawyer, although I have worked with them to draft contracts before. So that was a little bit new and scary for me. Um, and then I had to understand what the security testers had done once they'd done their assessment and whether it was good enough or had missed anything important. And I had to explain their pretty technical document to people who were paid way more than me. And if I screwed any of that up, I knew the result could be that people would treat New Brunswick driver's licenses as a less reliable means of people proving who they are, which can have major, major consequences for everyone who lives here. So in that case, I spent I forget whether it was between three and six months reading and trying out some of the assessment techniques the people we were hiring were using and reading different standards and documents about how an assessment of that type should be done, what the security requirements for identity documents at different assurance levels are, all about this company we'd contracted out the printing of the driver's licenses to, how their security policies worked. <clears throat> and the thing was, uh, this wasn't just an NB driver's license project all four Atlantic provinces banded together to purchase this same thing from the same company. But several of the other provinces didn't set aside the budget for security assessment that New Brunswick had because I'd convinced them to. And once they, these other provinces heard that New Brunswick was doing a security assessment, they just relied on our results, which were mainly up to me to arrange and collect and explain. That's a lot of responsibility for one person. And because I felt the weight of that responsibility, I spent a lot of evenings and weekends for, well, it says here a better part of a year, and I think that might be accurate, um, learning things I hoped would make it more likely for me to get it right. It was a lot of time outside of my job because I just felt like it was an important responsibility. And there have been a couple other times similar things have happened where I felt like the responsibility I was being asked to take on was quite large relative to how much I knew. And I know a lot of other people in this field who deal with a lot of stress from that same source. Too much responsibility, not enough time or knowledge to do as good a job as you'd like to. But on the other hand, at the end of the day, I feel like I did a good job in that and in those other cases, and a better job than other people in a similar situation might have done. And this is a career where I can honestly say that I feel like what I do makes a difference. So I really like that, because there are a lot of careers where you, you kind of wonder, how much difference am I making? And in cybersecurity, I don't feel like that's the case. 
So if cybersecurity sounds interesting to you, I've got some good news. Because as I said, cybersecurity is less well-established as a professional than things like law or medicine, there are pretty easy and either free or not very expensive ways to get the knowledge you need to get your first job and continue learning and advancing from there. Um, I know that the Cisco courses there uh, exist and are free for you to use. And um, my very first IT certification was a Cisco certified networking associate, and I highly, highly recommend it. Um, I will say, if you're looking to go to university, a computer science degree is helpful. The more of the technical fundamentals about computers you understand, the easier it's going to be to pick up a report about some new problem and quickly understand that too, rather than getting lost and confused. Um, but you don't have to wait until you graduate high school and then graduate university to get the knowledge you need. Um, because there isn't anything like the Law Society or the Association of Professional Engineers for Cybersecurity, how you prove you know your stuff is by getting certifications which are pretty cheap to get, usually a few hundred dollars, which is comparable to maybe one university course. Although I can't say that going that route is easy, the good certifications require you to know a lot before you can pass. So as I said, uh, to start off with, I personally took the Cisco Certified Networking Associate, CCNA. This is a well-respected certification in basic networking, and the fact that you really, really, to pass that exam, you have to have the knowledge burned into your brain um, means that although I took that exam 19 years ago now, I still know the stuff from it, and I still use that knowledge a lot. So when you get introduced to some basic networking stuff, if you learn it, even though we've moved on from IPv4 to IPv6 over the past 20 years, still the stuff that I learned 20 years ago, I use almost every day. So if you're questioning sometimes in school, well, when am I ever going to use this? If you end up in a career in cybersecurity, some of the basic networking and tech support is going to be your core knowledge. Um, <clears throat> other entry level certs that would be useful starting off are the CompTIA A plus and Security plus exams. At Service New Brunswick, uh, I can confirm, because I was part of the hiring process for students there, that we have hired students based on them having the Security Plus. As you get more advanced in cybersecurity, the most widely recognized certification is the Certified Information Systems Security Professional, or CISSP. Uh, you can't call yourself CISSP until you have five years of related experience, but you can take the exam before that and say you're at the associate level. Uh, if you want to get into hacking, the most well-known certification for that, for red teaming, is the Offensive Security Certified Professional, or OSCP. But uh, <clears throat> that one's expensive, and a fairly new certification out in the past couple of years called Practical, Net Network, uh, excuse me, Practical Network Penetration Tester. Uh, it's uh, getting good reviews by people who are in the security industry, and is a very similar exam to the OSCP, where to pass, what you have to do is conduct scans of a network, similar to the scan that I did on your website, get a foothold, and eventually compromise the whole um, network that they've set up for you, and then write a report about what you did, and present it to an experienced penetration tester and answer questions about why you did what you did. And that PNPT is only a few hundred dollars, oh, I, although I do think you'd need to study hard for maybe six months to a year or more to get the knowledge you'd need to pass. Um, if you want to learn hacking by actually going and doing it, I'd recommend two websites, Try Hack Me and Hack the Box. Both have free plans, which are good enough to learn on if you can't afford to pay, but also you can get premium plans with some more features for about $100 a year. Um, starting out, I'd recommend Try Hack Me because it guides you through the process of hacking vulnerable machines better than Hack the Box does. And both of these sites, the advantage there is you don't have to get permission before you start hacking. They're set up with vulnerabilities and you're meant to go after them. Um, so I'd recommend Try Hack Me first um, because it guides you through the process of hacking vulnerable machines better than Hack the Box does. But Hack the Box has walkthroughs as well. So if you wanted, you could start out with Hack the Box, probably get stuck pretty quickly, but then get the answer for answers for how to get unstuck from the walkthroughs. Um, also, one of the tools I used during my penetration test, Burp Suite, has a hundred different labs that you can work your way through for free. And after you've done that, you'll have a very good understanding of the different vulnerabilities in websites and web applications. Um, 
I guess another thing to note is overall, I'd say security people are very helpful. And like me, they want to bring people up and grow the workforce because we're all kind of overwhelmed. So if you follow some information security people on social media and show an interest, they're usually happy to answer questions and help you learn and grow. <clears throat> um, so if you wanted, uh, the information security instance of Mastodon is infosec.exchange. And you can follow a few people there. There's also a Discord group called Infosec Prep, which lists all of the uh, different um, resources you can get as you want to learn. And this changes year to year. So to keep up with what the current state of the art is in learning resources, uh, Info the Infosec Prep Discord group is great. Uh, if you want to just go see videos of people hacking to get a sense of what that's like or learn how to do it by watching, Plenty of hackers, <coughs> hackers stream their attempts to do things like hack the box, and you can follow them on Twitch or YouTube. Um, that's really, that kind of concludes what I had to say. It's a lot of content all at once, but I'm wondering, um, do you have questions that occurred to you? Um, do you want to know anything that I haven't talked about? Uh, I, Myron, I, I actually, I've, I've tried the, um, the Try Hack Me. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great platform. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's got all kinds of opportunities and, and hands-on labs there, which is great for, like, especially uh, for, for the students. Yep. Um, what, uh, one one question, just like your starting salary, so what you have to ask it. So, uh, how much do you make? How much would you make as like a starting salary entry level? Well, uh, uh, that really depends. Uh, I guess if you want to start and specialize in a particular thing, you uh, can end up starting if you've done a couple of years of training before you start in on a particular specialty uh, and you are willing to move. Like as with all IT jobs, uh, say down in the US in like California, you get paid huge amounts of money. Um, but starting here, um, it can be, I mean, when I started out as a programmer, this was in 2006 and I started at like 45,000, but I'd say it's probably 50, 55 now. Um, after getting a university degree with the government. I'd say um, your choice is, at least my experience has been, that your choice is between a job with real good job security or a job that pays quite a lot. And I went the route of going a government job with a good pension. And so the amount that I started at was lower than it would have been if I was hired on by one of the startups up on Knowledge Park. So. I say maybe 50,000, but maybe more than that if you go in into a startup. Um, but it really depends on your skills. What I would say is in the computer field, um, it's nice to have a degree and very helpful uh, to pass that filter if you're trying to get a government job. But what really matters is can you do the work? And if you show that you're really good at the work, you can get paid real good. <laughs> I think he deserves a round of applause. I think that uh, I think that's it for questions. Okay. See, I think yeah. he deserves a round of applause. So, uh, thank you so much, Myron. I have your your um, your layout for like your 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 talk today, which is great because there's lots of uh, points that have come up. So I may be in touch with you with some questions as we as we move further in the course. Because right now we're only we're we're really covering like hardware. Right, uh, mm -hmm. and we haven't gotten into the cyber bit, but when we get into the cyber bit, I may be getting in touch with you to to uh, you know, uh, maybe walk us through a couple of things or or with a question or two. Sure, absolutely. And if there are people who you feel like this is something you're really interested in, I'm willing to just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about it if that's something that interests you and point you in the right direction. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, yes, you're welcome. Visit. 
know I know I gotta have another one later on this afternoon with uh, I think it's the St. John School, was it? Take that song. Uh, yeah, Kathy. Shoot, what's her name? Um, yeah. McDonald. Yes. Yeah, Kathy McDonald. Yeah. So good. Good luck with that one this afternoon. Thank you, and All thank right. you for for your time. Take care. You too. Bye bye. Bye.